The year was 2005, and the video game industry was on the brink of revolution. Yes, the Nintendo Revolution. Other than that code name, we knew very little about Nintendo's next console. But a title so profound naturally led to some incredibly ambitious speculation. The GameCube might have been a financial success, but it wasn't always a critical one. So what could Nintendo be planning that would give them the confidence to name their next system something so powerful? Fast forward a few months and we found out that they weren't actually calling the system anything as awesome or inspiring as the Revolution. No, <laughs> that's a dumb name. No, 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 no. Instead, we're gonna call it the Wii. Sometimes things happen that make me burst out laughing every time I think about them. And for just a little while, the Wii was one of those things. And then, at the After Hours press conference at E3 2006, this happened. Oh my god, Hyper Combos! Mario to Stupak! <laughs> Meta Knight, he looks so cool! And... is that... Holy crap, they're bringing Pit back?! Zero Suit Samus! Wario! I, I, I can't! I just can't wait! I mean, I'm with Cartman on this one! I'm thinking it's time to cryogenically freeze myself and... Showtime! And just like that, the Wii was a joke no more. For the next few years, a palpable aura of pure hype would shine ever brighter over the horizon. DK Vine talked about all the bitter arguments that ensue between fan bases when a new Smash is on its way, and yeah, there is a lot of that. It always gets ugly when immature people start hurling around death threats just because their guy didn't get in, but as loud as they are, the people acting like this are only the vocal minority. For most of us, while emotions can run high and debates can get heated, it's only the very infantile that give the rest a bad name. Other than that, it comes from such a genuine excitement. All these fan bases coming together for one game is like nothing else in the industry. Of course, that would be easy for me to say. After all, my guy got in. October 10th, 2007 was a landmark day in gaming for a couple of reasons, but at the time, all I cared about was this. Sonic's the name speeds my game! Remember, Sonic the Hedgehog was less than a year removed from a game that very nearly killed his franchise. The blue blur needed this. While we waited in line for the Wii to launch, we were hyped for Smash. On forums across the internet, in tournaments across the world, and at 3 in the freaking morning when the official website updated, we were hyped for Smash. For two years, we learned, debated, and waited. For two years, this game redefined hype, and at last, it all finally culminated on March 9th, 2008. Once again, it's time! Oh, uh, the announcer doesn't do it in this one. Right, well... <clears throat> Super Smash Brothers! Melee was a game absolutely brimming with content, which makes it all the more impressive that its sequel was once again able to exceed it to such a degree. Just about every mode and option that was in Melee is still represented here, and the new additions, well, the phrase my cup runneth over comes to mind. The cast of playable characters has gone all the way up to 39, but for the first time, not everybody from the previous game made it into this one. On the bright side, everyone who got cut was either a clone character or had some sort of comparable analog introduced, so it wasn't a big loss. The only one I was a little miffed over was replacing Mewtwo with Lucario, but eh, I get it. You don't want the entire Pokemon franchise represented only by its first generation. The clones that were left weren't really clones at all anymore. They were similar, sure, but they were much better differentiated than they had been in Melee. With plenty of unique moves, animations, and attributes, even between characters as similar as Fox and Falco, you can't really call anyone here a true clone the way you could before. And how about those newcomers? Brawl even has two characters that weren't created by Nintendo. Hailing from Metal Gear... Solid Snake tactically espionaged his way into Brawl, and his inclusion has become a bit of a controversy in the years since, with some saying he doesn't really fit in with Nintendo's style. To that I say, 
this is already a game where the happy-go-lucky cartoon mascot gets to uppercut the heroine of a series that bases itself around isolated exploration. Remember? The idea of a consistent tone went out the window a long time ago. And while the Metal Gear Solid series was always closely associated with the PlayStation, remember that Snake did get his start with Nintendo, at least in the US. But for the other third-party character, there was no question that he deserved to be here. Sonic the Hedgehog was literally created to rival Mario and wrest the crown away from Nintendo. And for a while, that's exactly what Sega did. But with the console wars of the 90s long past, it only made sense that players should finally have the chance to settle the score. Having Sonic and Mario in the same game, let alone having him in a fighting game with Nintendo's All-Stars, was a dream match like no other. And this game finally made that dream a reality. Sonic might have been the one that I was most excited for, but Brawl had an incredibly strong cast of debuting characters. Some we had been wanting for years, some we had never considered, and some, some that were redefined by their appearance in Brawl. The industry had seen a lot of changes in the six and a half years since Melee, but compared to the 17 years that had passed since the star of Kid Icarus had been in a game, six and a half seems downright inconsequential. Pit was in some ways comparable to the Ice Climbers from Melee, a star of the 8-bit era who hadn't been seen since. But where the Ice Climbers were largely referential, Pit's revival in Smash would be inspirational. Sakurai took the series in as a pet project, reimagined the character, and reinvigorated his world. Pit had been a relic of a bygone age, but Brawl would cement him as another one of Nintendo's icons. He's back again, and about time too. It's the next member of the King Maid crew. Well, actually, he didn't really go anywhere. Diddy Kong has never gone more than a year or two without making some sort of appearance. Beginning with his debut in 1994's Donkey Kong Country, Diddy would take a starring role in several classic Rareware games, including DKC2 and Diddy Kong Racing. So why would a character who was about as abundant as snow atop Gorilla Glacier before the Tiki Tac tribe caused the volcano atop Donkey Kong Island to explode you know what, why would a character who's about as abundant as contrived metaphors belong on a list of kings? Diddy might have been well known before his appearance in Brawl, but Smash gave him some characteristic mannerisms. Before Brawl, Diddy's peanut pop guns and rocket barrel jetpack had mostly been tucked into his... wherever he puts them for nine years, since Donkey Kong 64. But since Brawl brought them back, Diddy almost literally has not appeared without them. Both pieces of gear were incorporated into his gameplay in the Return series, and they've become as closely associated with him as the Big Gorilla's tie. There are a couple more characters you can make good arguments for. Lucas helped to let the Western world know that Earthbound had gotten a sequel. Ike gave Fire Emblem that much more of a push. And Nintendo's robotic operating buddy was once again dragged out of mothballs to play a central role in something the series had never tried before an honest-to-god story mode called the Subspace Emissary. The mode largely turns the gameplay from a competitive fighter to a side-scrolling beat-em-up, where you are in the story determines who you're able to play as. And in fact, it's possible to unlock every single character just by playing through it. There are mini puzzles, secret rooms, and even some epic boss battles. Best of all, the whole plot is tied together by an extensive amount of pre-rendered cutscenes, with the rule of cool in full effect. They're bombastic and exciting, yet still incredibly faithful to the personality of the characters. The the mode is absolutely worth playing through once just to experience them. But is it worth playing through twice? Well, no. There are two major problems with it. The first is that while the personality and interactions of the characters are all on point, the setting just isn't. The story takes place in the WORLD OF TROPHIES! And that turns out to be a pretty bland place. Instead of being a mismatch of iconic locales, it mostly ends up just feeling incredibly generic. The original enemy designs are a lot more creative, but the point stands. Why aren't I fighting Kremlings in the jungle? Why is Bowser's army everywhere? What the crap is this thing? But the bigger issue is that while Subspace Emissary was fun, it wasn't anywhere near as fun as the real game. But look, this is Super Smash Bros. to me. The core of the experience is a fighting game. Everything else might help the series stand out as this big celebration of all things Nintendo, but they are still ultimately extras. They're the delicious whipped cream atop the core fighting mechanic Sunday. So many development resources went into this thing that most players are only ever going to bother with once. It's like a smaller, less tasty Sunday atop the delicious one that you really wanted. Look, having a story mode of some kind is an incredible idea for this series. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that you're really squandering an opportunity to see these universes collide if you don't have the characters interact in some way. I'm not quite sure how you'd strike a good balance, but Subspace Emissary was just tedious and unfocused. But at at least it could be played through with a friend. In fact, that solo title on the menu is quite a misnomer. Everything behind that option, aside from classic mode, can now be played in co-op multiplayer. Co-op is something the industry could really use more of. 
and getting to take down the whole cast together in All-Star, our team up to decimate Sandbag was a blast. There are also plenty of awesome new levels to fight on, but while the Wii's power allowed for more creativity, I just don't know that it was always used well. Newport City, for instance, is just way too freaking big and random, and playing it on a CRT back in 08 made it almost unplayable. Stages based entirely on retro titles like Mario Brothers sounded cool, but turned out to be incredibly flawed in execution. Speaking of which, we had constantly scrolling stages like Mushroomy Kingdom. Does anybody really like these? When you're good at a game like this, your focus needs to be on your opponent, not whether your own character is about to scroll off screen. Maybe that's why another one of my favorite new features is the stage builder. While it might be a bit limited in some ways, it was always fun to try out unique, ridiculous stage designs, and they would end up becoming highly influential in the development of our own personal metagame. Yeah, we played Brawl so much that we had our own specific specific style and rules. And let me tell you, it made an absolute mockery of the competitive scene. We play a series of what we called Random Battles Cloud. Quick matches on random stages with random characters. When we got tired of that, the true battles would begin. The first of these was an all-Captain Falcon match on the custom stage SMA 2 Fort. After that, we'd play a match with our mains on another custom called Final Smash. The stages I built were gigantic and had absolutely no potential for silly concepts that none of us ever bothered to get good at, like edge guarding. I kid, but really, fun in Smash Brothers is what you make of it, and stage builders still gave Brawl way more potential for customability than Melee. There was just so much to this game! You could play this surprisingly addicting little shooting game to get trophies, you could play online, which, I mean, it was so laggy it's barely worth mentioning, but there was a huge list of challenges to overcome! The amount of trophies was almost doubled! You could play retro games like Donkey Kong for 30 seconds if for some reason you wanted to. Assist trophies were added as a complement to the always brilliant Pokeball, allowing more cameos than ever. Customize stage music, save replays, take screenshots, make dioramas, continue to tilt the menu with the C-Stick. With all these options and modes and features and just stuff, how can this not be the definitive Smash Brothers? Well, about that. You might notice that in contrast to the first two videos, I've gone this long without saying a word about the core gameplay. And that's because while everything else about the game expanded greatly, the gameplay itself... Uh, didn't. There was one significant upgrade with Brawl, and that came through a new item, the Smash Ball. It would float randomly around the stage when it showed up, and whoever managed to break it open would gain access to a final smash. This would be a super powerful move, a transformation, or in entirely too many cases, a landmaster, that would make it easy to KO opponents. No, not the game dance! No! They'd been in the works in 64, and I really enjoyed them. But other than that, after Melee honed the core mechanics with such precision, how much further could you even go without changing the game entirely? Throwing a whole lot more complication into the gameplay would only lead to diminishing returns. No, from here on, Smash would be invigorated by its characters rather than sweeping changes to its mechanics. And that's not a bad thing. Melee could be picked up and enjoyed by anyone. It's as intuitive as any other Smash. But in Melee, high-level players aren't just going to beat newbies, they're going to utterly dominate even those who know what they're doing. The only way you can really stand a chance against a competitive player in Melee is to play competitively yourself, to learn those advanced techniques, and it takes a great deal of specific practice to hone those skills. Whether or not that's a problem is extremely subjective, but it is pretty clear that Sakurai saw it as one. Scaling back on the exploitable elements that allowed that to happen would have been fine, but it seemed almost like Sakurai had some kind of resentment for Melee's competitive aspects with this game. Because Brawl didn't just stumble, it fell flat on its face. Yes, pratfall. At any point in the match, smashing the control stick would carry a tiny chance of face planting into the ground. It was a random element, but unlike items, it couldn't be turned off. So no sugarcoating it. This is the stupidest design choice I have ever seen in a Nintendo game. The game was also slowed down, and while I do think Melee might have been a touch too fast, Brawl was... well... You're too slow! People always say it's floaty, and that's about more than just airspeed. One of Melee's great strengths was how sharp and kinetic movement and attacking felt, and Brawl was comparatively imprecise. It is a tricky, tricky thing to balance a game, and it's not something that should be done with broad strokes. But the returning cast just hovers around this weird, mediocre average. Characters like Marth and Mario, who I love to play in Melee, were just so much less fun in Brawl. And remember, I'm not even talking about this from like a super competitive standpoint, because I was never that kind of player. I'm saying that even right after 
launch, while I could barely stop playing Brawl, I'd go back to Melee for a match or two, and it was obvious that the older game was just more solid. It even seemed like some of Brawl's characters were balanced with the assumption that items would be on. One of the most obvious is my main, Sonic. He's faster than everyone, as he should be, and he has all kinds of quick moves that can rack up a ton of damage. But he absolutely sucks at actually KOing anyone. On the other hand, that speed means that he has no problem getting a hold of powerful items, and he has bar none the best final smash in the game. Super Sonic is way too strong, and once you learn to control him, he is guaranteed to KO everyone on the screen at least once. He might be my main, but I can admit, that's no good. Melee's hyper-competitive, highly technical scene was downright impenetrable without hundreds of hours of practice, and I don't think that's Smash Brothers. But neither is it a random chaotic party game largely devoid of skill, and Brawl wasn't anywhere near that bad, but it definitely pushed the game much too far in that direction. Because Sakurai took it that far, he gimped the most important part of any video game, the gameplay, and Brawl was worse for it the competitive crowd and casual players alike. The worst part is, all these attempts at balance didn't even work. A character far more broken than anything in Melee still emerged, and the game was found to have all kinds of downright unfair chain grabs and stalls. Oh, uh, one more comparatively minor complaint. I kinda hate Brawl's visuals. Melee might have been more realistic, but it was still bright and colorful. Brawl's murky, muted, monotonous color palette just robs the atmosphere of a bit too much vibrancy. So with all this in mind, if I could only play either Melee or Brawl for the rest of my life, what would I choose? I would choose Brawl every single time. Why? Well, in spite of a few questionable design choices, I do absolutely adore this game. I realize I've spent a great deal of this video critiquing certain aspects of it, but I have still played it exponentially more than any other Smash. Even though that course Sunday might not be quite as sweet as Melee's, I do think the total package makes up for it. Sure, the Melee metagame was almost entirely gone, but that wasn't the game that I played anyway. Remember, from here on, the series would be invigorated by new characters and the playstyles they brought, and Brawl was no exception. The Smash Brothers that I knew and loved might have been twisted a bit in the wrong direction, but the heart of the game was still intact. But there is another reason I would take Brawl over Melee. GAME MODIFICATION! The Wii was so freaking easy to mod, it almost became open source, and so Brawl could be modified, bringing one of the great strengths usually reserved for PC gaming to Smash Brothers. From this sprung an endless cavalcade of costumes, stages, and even all new fighters. Most of these were pretty terribly implemented, but I mean, come on! I got to play as beautiful Joe. As the scene grew, people came together to customize the game in more specific ways. Imagine what a sequel to Melee might have been like had Sakurai embraced the technical, nuanced, and highly competitive gameplay that its most dedicated players discovered. That is Project M. The development team has made one of the most professional, complete mods I've ever seen, and I just love how they emerged from the Flame Wars to create this game that they wanted. Really, even calling it a mod is kind of a disservice to the developers at this point. This is an entirely new Smash Brothers game, and it brings way more to the table than just reinstituting Melee's mechanics. You don't even actually have to modify your Wii or Wii U if you want to try it out, and I definitely recommend you do. But maybe you want something a bit less serious. Brawl Minus has a motto, break the game until it gets better. The idea is to give every character ridiculous buffs until they're all hilariously overpowered, and thus, balance is achieved. It's insane, it's utterly broken, and it's some of the most pure fun I've had with any game. I actually got so used to playing with mods and customizing the game, it was a bit jarring to go back to Vanilla Brawl for this video. But you know what? I will never forget that day, March 9th, 2008. I picked Brawl up at midnight, I came home, and together my best friend and I beat the Subspace Emissary in a single setting. Even after he went home, I kept going. I played Super Smash Bros. Brawl from just after midnight until almost 7.30pm, over 18 hours. And in the years since then, I've never really stopped. Brawl might not have been the single killer app that Melee was, but it was still the game that made us take something as ridiculous as the Wii seriously. And it is one of the greatest titles the Little White Box has to offer. It's kind of hard to believe that it really has been six and a half years, but that must be the magic number, because once again, a brand new Smash Brothers game is in our hands. But we'll talk about that... eventually. Yeah, not next time, no, eventually. I'm gonna be playing a ton of Smash 4, but if there's one thing this series has taught me, it's that I seem to find a gigaton to talk about when it comes to Smash. And that'll take some time to percolate. Besides, I've got something else planned for next time. A certain video game's 20th anniversary just happens to fall on the same day as Smash 4's release. And if you listen, you can hear it coming. Want access to these videos before everyone else? How about a critique on the game of your choice? These are just some of the rewards available on my all-new Patreon page. Take a look and back me up. Hit that subscribe button if you enjoy my work. 
And if you know other people who might, share me on your favorite forums, subreddits, and multi-user dungeons. And if that's too much effort, just smack the thumbs up, which will let the evil YouTube robots know that my video is worth seeing. Or something like that, anyway. A huge thank you goes out to Kovar, who quickly became my first ever patron. Your support is incredibly appreciated. Check out the rest of the Smash Brothers series if you missed it, and go back and watch all my other episodes. Like me on Facebook and follow me on Twitter for status updates and commentary. Back me up on Patreon, and you keep geeking, I'll keep critiquing. Thanks for watching.